morning. Is this is the mic on? Sounds like sounds like it is. All right. Thanks for coming today. Um, it's uh, not every day you get to open for the Rolling Stones, but I'm glad to be the opening act here today. Um, in, in, terms, in terms of uh, disclosures, I've had relationships with Abbott and Medtronic. Um, some of what we're going to talk about today is off-label and investigational. Um, none of the relationships are, for me, are particularly pertinent. It's those mostly have to do with uh, ventriculosis devices. Um, so I want to start with the case. It's on. Okay, it's on now. So the people on the phone missed my jokes. But um, so I want to start today with a case, and this is a, a person I saw just last week. A 77-year-old man, prior bypass, paroxysmal flutter or fib, had a flutter ablation in 2013. Has a heart failure reserve ejection fraction, and now he says he sleeps a lot. He can only walk 10 to 20 feet, whereas six months ago he could walk more than a mile. Um, in terms of his evaluation, uh, had aortic stenosis. It wasn't entirely clear if it was moderate or severe. He had very reassuring pulmonary function tests, had sleep apnea, and he said that he used his uh, CPAP religiously. Uh, blood pressure well controlled, heart rate is certainly reasonable. Um, he's on, a, I would say, a very typical combination of antihypertensives and uh, anticoagulants for a, a patient with this medical history, and had reassuring laps. Um, like I said on his echo, I uh, had largely preserved ejection fraction, was described as having grade three diastolic filling and elevated EE prime. Uh, RV was normal, mild dysfunction. His valve area was estimated to be 0 0.8, a mean gradient of 12, peak velocity of 2.2, and a dimensional index of 0.21. So he was referred for angiography that showed patent grafts. His native vessels were occluded, but had widely patent grafts. Um, and on a valve study, was uh, found to have only moderate stenosis. Um, I think what was also notable about this study is, you know, when a patient with unexplained dyspnea had a right heart catheterization done, and at baseline, although he was a little hypertensive, his wedge pressure was pretty preserved, but with a little bit of arm exercise, his pulmonary capillary wedge pressure jumped up pretty substantially, uh, and, and we'll come back to that throughout the morning here. So when I see patients with heart failure preserved ejection fraction, I have sort of a mental checklist that I go through. Um, first of all, or do they have any uncommon etiologies? Could these symptoms be something masquerading, constriction, restrictive disease, amyloid? Um, and I think many of you were here when uh, Dr. Sanjeev Shah from Northwestern spoke about uh, six months or a year and a half ago, I, I know it was in May, um, about uh, phenotyping of patients with heart failure preserved ejection fraction. And so um, I try to use that framework in terms of what I emphasize of how I'm treating patients, whether it's exercise-induced, pulmonary hypertension, or more of a volume overloaded phenotype, and then address the comorbidities that we can. Fix the coronary disease, address atrial arrhythmias, address sleep disorder breathing, address anemia, and if they're obese or deconditioned, try and address that. Um, if, if you think back to the patient I just presented, his coronary disease has been addressed, his rate's controlled, he has sleep apnea, but it's treated, he's not anemic, and he was actually not a particularly obese man. Um, and so one of the other things that we've started doing a little bit more is uh, addressing congestion with cardiomens, and I'll mention that briefly. Um, there's at least one trial suggesting spironolactone may have benefit, although it's, uh, was, most of the benefit was seen in the North American subgroup uh, of that trial. Uh, there was a recent study um, suggesting that nitrates actually may worsen exercise, and so that's often in conflict with treating the coronary disease. And then finally, for patients like this, I think it's incumbent upon us to be considering them for clinical trials. So I just want to mention quickly the role of cardiomems in these patients. Uh, this is a plantable pulmonary artery sensor uh, that we've been using more and more of. I think we have about 65 patients in our practice now that we follow that have this. Uh, it's been shown to significantly reduce the risk of hospitalization for heart failure. And I think what's notable is that the benefit is the same, if not even greater in patients with a preserved ejection fraction. So this is one of the few evidence-based treatments that we have for this pool of patients. Um, but again, thinking about this in general, uh, most patients present with some form of effort intolerance. And it's thought from a pathophysiologic standpoint that a lot of this is driven by an increase in the left atrial pressure during exercise. Uh, we can learn something from an old syndrome called Ludenbacher syndrome that was published in 1916, although was originally described in 1750 by this uh, German gentleman here on the right. And this is a combination of mitral stenosis and secundum ASD. And what, what was found in this condition was that when people had this ASD, 
they didn't have they didn't become as symptomatic from their mitral stenosis and they often would live much longer than would be predicted on the basis of the mitral stenosis alone the concept here being that it's, it works almost like a pop-off valve. And so this is uh, from a, a recent study looking at uh, both some actual and then uh, some simulated pressure measurements of this type of condition. And specifically on the top panel here, you can see this is a patient with severe uh, mitral stenosis. They've got you know, enormous V waves uh, in initial tracing when their uh, ASD is occluded. And then when it's open, you can see that those dramatically uh, blunted. Um, similarly, when it's uh, with a computer simulation, it sort of suggests the same marker. Um, taking this further, uh, this same group that was working on simulations and trying to understand from a theoretical standpoint how this might work, um, they did some pressure volume loops. And for those of you that don't look at these every day, uh, smaller and down to the left is generally considered advantageous in terms of the heart is filling and it's working at lower pressures and there's l less work that's being expended. And so it, in this study, they were simulating the presence of an atrial septal defect or a shunt and the blue readings are baseline and the red is with the shunt. And what they found was that with the shunt, the uh, pressure volume loop for the uh, left atrium uh, shifted down into the left at rest. Uh, and the LV pressure did as well. Uh, and more importantly, I think what you can see if you look in the upper right panel is that with exercise, people that don't have a shunt have a pretty significant shift to the upper right quadrant uh, of their pressure volume loop with exercise. And so that, in a sense, this describes the phenotype of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction where people are able to generate the same cardiac output, but they do it at a higher pressure. And that pressure is often what leads to a lot of the symptoms people have. So, you know, we, we, uh, Paul and I wanted to talk today a little bit about the intersection between heart failure and structural disease because I think there's a lot of overlap and we're going to see a lot more of it in the future. So, you know, from my standpoint as a heart failure cardiologist, this is, I'm a little bit of a fish out of water um, in that although we deal with valve disease all the time, I'm by no means an expert on it. Um, this is very common in heart failure patients, whether they have LV failure, RV, or biventricular failure, especially with mitral valve disease, if they have a low ejection fraction, the outcomes are pretty poor. Um, and it's not too infrequent that we'll see a patient that had mitral valve surgery and, and it's now six or 12 months later and they're struggling and now they need a VAD. It's unusual that their surgery was done here, but this happens where people get this surgery and it probably was not the right operation for them. Um, and from my perspective, medications will often make mitral valve <coughs> disease in particular better. So we have this mantra of, in, in a sense, most patients that we see with uh, ventricular failure, we want to decongest them, vasodilate them, and treat their heart failure. <clears throat> so we really spend a lot of our time on what I think of as the alphabet soup of heart failure, of pushing the beta blockers, pushing the ACE, ARNI, ARBs, defibrillators, considering a loss or an antagonist, all the things that we do for other heart failure patients. And we have not typically thought of the valve disease as, you know, it, it sometimes is a primary pathology, but it hasn't been our primary target. And so uh, as a heart failure cardiologist, um, I'm starting to shift my thinking on this a little bit. So I want to start, I'm going to go anatomically, so to speak, through the heart and talk a little bit about uh, my approach to medical management first of tricuspid disease. Uh, and believe it or not, the whole concept of Starling's law and preload afterload contractility is something that I think is really useful, whether you're talking about the LV, the RV, or both. The challenge with tricuspid disease, however, is that it's tough to know what your volume status should be, what should the goal be, and in particular, if you rely on jugular venous pressure to estimate someone's fluid status, this is hard to do if they've got severe tricuspid regurgitation. They have a pulsatile vein. Where do you take it, even if you have an invasive pressure tracing? what's their actual volume status. So I think this is something that's hard to measure and hard to pick a good goal. Um, afterload reduction, um, pulmonary vasodilators um, unfortunately remain pretty expensive for this and using them for tricuspid valve disease is off label. Um, I end up writing several uh, authorization or you know, requests for uh, appeals for patients who, for example, get uh, RV failure after they uh, get an LVAD and pursuing pulmonary vasodilator treatment. And often these patients have low pulmonary artery pressures. They don't meet conventional pulmonary arterial hypertension criteria, so payers aren't eager to pay for these drugs. Um, it's the same thing with tricuspid regurgitation. If you have a patient that you think might benefit from RV afterload, 
Um, this is one approach, uh, but it's certainly something that's not conventional and it can be a challenge. Contractility, um, the only thing we really have here is digoxin, and there's uh, no data that I'm aware of using this specifically to treat tricuspid regurgitation. Um, and then, of course, we have to consider addressing the anatomy or any mechanical causes, whether it's a device lead that's tethering a leaflet, for example, uh, or just dilation from long-standing atrial fibrillation. So what I wanted to do is I spent a little bit of time reviewing what is some of the contemporary literature on what we know about isolated uh, valve disease. And this was a study of 353 patients with isolated tricuspid regurgitation, average age of 70, uh, disproportionately female, preserved LV function, and they specifically wanted only patients with an RV systolic pressure less than 50, the idea here being to try to understand the primary valve pathology rather than tricuspid regurgitation as a consequence of pulmonary hypertension. Um, they had to have no other valve disease greater than mild and couldn't have any PACER or ICD wires. So this was a pretty pure population of isolated tricuspid regurgitation. Um, severe disease was defined as an effective uh, regurgitant orifice area of greater than 40, uh, and, uh, or 0.4, I should say. Um, was difficult to study uh, due to confounders, uh, pulmonary hypertension, left-sided disease. Um, these are factors that, again, the authors tried to work this out. And one of the challenges that's always been present in assessing tricuspid valve disease is when is this an independent risk factor of problems and when is this a surrogate or a consequence of other problems? Um, it's also clear that the indications for isolated surgery and timing are something we just don't know very well. And so this was uh, uh, stratified by the ERO, um, and you can see that the patients with a much greater effective regurgitant orifice um, had a much worse survival, um, although even here you can see the five-year survival um, in the poorer category was two-thirds, which is not bad for a, a group of patients with such significant disease. Um, they also looked at whether they were in atrial fibrillation or sinus rhythm or whether they had symptoms or not and found that that didn't make a difference. So patients with severe TR clearly have worse outcomes, uh, again, highlighting part of why we sh this is something we should care about and be aware of. Um, it's also been associated with increased mortality independent of RV pressure and RV failure. And this was a, a huge study, a systematic review, 70 studies, 32,000 patients, followed for a mean of 3.2 years. Uh, moderate and severe disease was associated with uh, essentially doubling of mortality risk. And you can see there's a dose response here that by the time people have severe disease, there's really a big difference. Um, they tried adjusting for RV dysfunction, systolic PA pressure, uh, LV function, mitral regurgitation, and presence or absence of atrial fibrillation. None of these factors uh, mitigated this. The idea here being that patients that have isolated or severe tricuspid regurgitation have a worse risk of uh, poor outcomes uh, re regardless of whether these factors are present or not. So it seems to suggest that merely having this alone is a problem. Um, when we look long-term, uh, this was a study of almost 4,000 patients, all with a low ejection fraction. Um, you might think that these are patients that are uh, going to do even worse. Um, uh, this was a pool of 70% had a non-significant MR, and they had a median survival of 4.9 years. <clears throat> but in the patients that had severe tricuspid regurgitation and a low ejection fraction, median survival was a year and a half, which is something that um, I wouldn't have guessed that it was that poor. We typically think of tricuspid regurgitation as a relatively benign lesion. Um, one of the strengths of this study is that they had a very long median follow-up of uh, over eight years. They excluded patients with AS or AI that was more than moderate and uh, if they had mitral stenosis or their valve replaced. I mean, you can see that patients that have any moderate um, tricuspid regurgitation clearly take a big mortality hit and that's evident even over the first couple of years. So, when do we operate on these patients? What do we do about these patients? This is a, a big challenge. Uh, this is a series from uh, the 157 uh, replacements and 84 repairs done in all of France over a two-year period. <clears throat> a relatively younger cohort, age of 61, half women, a low incidence of coronary disease, low incidence of heart failure. A modest percentage of these had endocarditis, which is obviously a, a different uh, category. They had high in-hospital mortality, 20% uh, risk of major complications. And I would argue this is a pretty healthy population that, you know, at mean age of 61 and 10% risk of coronary disease, um, they still didn't do very well, had a median hospitalization of 26 days. So to me, one of the big questions that I think we as a field are facing 
is now that we're starting to see some transcatheter options for treating tricuspid valve disease, is that going to help educate us on when we should be intervening on these patients? Um, and I've often thought that there's two appropriate times to fix the tricuspid valve. It's either too early, we shouldn't do it yet, or it's far too late, the RV's shot, it's, we've missed our window of opportunity. So I'm hopeful that the transcatheter error is going to help us understand that uh, better. Um, it's pretty clear that people that are already having left-sided surgery should have their tricuspid regurg regurgitation addressed. Um, this is a meta-analysis uh, showing that it, uh, risk of death and all-cause mortality is better in patients that have their tricuspid valve repaired when they're having left-sided surgery for other indications. So I want to shift gears now and talk about the mitral valve, again, from the perspective of uh, someone who predominantly does heart failure. Uh, and this was a series uh, over 10 years of uh, 1,300 patients with moderate to severe mitral regurgitation. Uh, this was recently published in Lancet. It's a series from Mayo, a median age of 77, and a substantial fraction had uh, impaired LV function. A mean ERO uh, was 0.25, uh, and half the uh, cardiovascular deaths, uh, or I should say half these patients died of cardiovascular death and the relative risk for dying of cardiovascular death in patients with moderate to severe mitral regurgitation, controlling for other factors, Charlton index and uh, other medical comorbidities, um, having moderate to severe mitral regurgitation doubled your risk of death. Um, they had 64% of these patients had heart failure at five years, which I thought that was lower than I would have expected. Um, and they also found that only 15% of this entire cohort had surgery, and of those that had surgery, or I should say of those with an LV EF less than 50%, um, only 5% of those patients were referred to surgery. So this is clearly uh, a disease that has substantial morbidity and mortality. We have not had great treatments in terms of the surgical options. And, and again, this is from Rochester. Um, and so, you know, in a place that is generally accepted to be pretty good at what they're doing, um, only about 25% of the patients that had class one in, you know, uncontroversial surgical indications were having surgery. Um, and here's a graph showing the ex observed to expected mortality, and you can see that regardless of the ejection fraction, and, and the patients with low EF clearly did worse. Um, and I think one of the things that's notable here um, is in the EF less than 50% group, you can see that by two years, only about 60% of these patients are still alive. Um, and I, I can't give a talk without mentioning a little bit about LVADs. Um, that's a, uh, condition that we now have an 80% survival at two years. So people with this severe of mitral valve disease might also be candidates for other treatments. Um, what about medical therapy? So this is a paper looking at the management and outcomes and, and the distribution of how people are managing this. People with a moderate to severe functional MR with severely reduced EF, um, almost 1,500 patients, 75% um, were treated with medical therapy. Yet if you go to the guidelines on what is medical therapy for MR, it's, this is it. This is all it says. It's reasonable. It's a 2A indication. Um, and uh, if your EF is less than 60%, oh, and by the way, don't use vasodilators uh, if you have normal systolic function. So there's not a lot that we know about medical therapy for MR, and that which has been recommended is not as evidence-based as we often like to think. Um, so looking at this pool of patients, those that had surgery clearly had an improved outcome. Um, and uh, we'll skip the multivariable analysis here. Um, so I think it's fair to ask whether medical therapy actually alters the course of this. Um, this is a, another recent paper looking at uh, patients that had this at baseline and then at 50 months. 31% um, had severe MR at baseline. 38% uh, of those improved to non-severe. Um, so as the pill pusher, I, I can't help but acknowledge that the, the pills do often work and we often can make people's mitral regurgitation better. Um, and 18%, uh, almost one in five, progressed to develop severe mitral regurgitation despite guideline-directed medical therapy. If pa people had sustained severe functional MR or it got worse, um, they had a two and a half times risk of major adverse events. Um, and left bundle and diabetes in this cohort were predictive of deterioration. Um, Another question that comes up is, well, what if, if someone has severe MR and we make it better, does that help their prognosis? This is a pool of 250 patients, and if they had progression both on univariate and multivariate analysis, 
um, if the disease progressed, that predicted mortality. That's not surprising. What I thought was notable in this study was that if patients had regression of mitral regurgitation, they didn't have as much benefit as you might have expected. Um, another question that comes up, well, what about new therapies? Um, we now have Valsartan Secubitril. Um, this was a study of uh, about 120 patients randomized to this versus Valsartan alone. Um, and they found that uh, there was a decrease in the effective regurgitant orifice area and regurgitant volume in patients that were treated with this combination. Um, so this is certainly not to suggest that there's no role for medical therapy. Um, that pool also had uh, a little bit uh, greater fraction that were improved as opposed to stabilized or worsened. Looking at patients with acutely compensated heart failure, um, we can see that in particular patients with a low ejection fraction um, had some stratification of risk of uh, all-cause mortality and heart failure readmission. Um, but patients with preserved ejection fraction, it wasn't as clear. And this is, you'll notice this is just in a year after discharge. So this is in people that are admitted with acutely compensated heart failure. What impact does MR have on that? And it, it clearly does, particularly in the low EF patients. Now, as a heart failure cardiologist, we get excited about things like uh, favorable LV remodeling, um, improved neurohormones. Um, and so this is a summary of some changes after a mitra clip. And I think you can see the arrows there on the bottom show that the left atrial volume didn't change. Uh, but otherwise, the green goes with green and the brown goes with brown. You can see at least favorable trends of LV ejection fraction improving and diastolic volume and systolic volume all get better um, in patients who are treated with mitra clip. And if I remember correctly, I think this was a one-year follow-up. Um, or no, that was, that was shorter term. I think that may have been six months. This one is a year. Um, this looked at 41 patients treated with mitra clip and also saw that their left atrial volume and systolic diameter and EF all improved favorably in patients that were treated uh, with uh, transcatheter therapy. Um, I wasn't able to find much in terms of the impact on neurohormones. Uh, there was one study looking at noradrenaline levels that didn't see any change, but did see an improvement in sympathetic nerve activity, which is another way for us to assess this. And then just a couple quick comments about bivalvular heart failure, and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Saraja. Um, this, I thought this was a really interesting study about 1,000 patients that had moderate to severe biventricular functional regurgitation, uh, so mitral and tricuspid disease. Uh, patients with severe bivalvular disease had more symptoms, worse remodeling, and increased neurohormonal activation more mortality, and uh, this was independent of clinical and echo parameters and the level of neurohormonal activation. So um, medical management for bivalvular disease, same stuff, diuresis and vasodilators. Um, but in terms of the outcomes, you can see that the, the two are clearly additive. When you have both diseases, you have severe TR and severe MR, um, these are patients that have an almost threefold risk of mortality. And, and here, uh, this just shows it in the form of Kaplan-Meier curve, that patients with isolated severe functional regurgitation, um, again, you know, 20 months, survival in the 70% range, my bench, mental benchmark is 80% two-year survival with an LVAD. So these are arguably patients that are sicker than many of the patients that we're currently implanting LVAD. So from a medical perspective, this is a, a, an important disease that has a lot of mortality and morbidity, um, and I think that the current treatments have really been inadequate. So it's exciting to be in an environment where we're starting to see some new technologies and some new treatments to address this problem. So at this point, I will invite Dr. Suraja up and we'll switch microphones. If you're a full pusher, I'm definitely the rolling stone. <laughs> At least that joke earlier. Okay. Okay. Could we have the lights a little bit lower? Well, good morning, everyone. So um, I have the distinct pleasure of speaking on uh, the intersection of heart failure and structural heart disease. And here are my disclosures. So you heard a really nice overview from uh, Peter about heart failure and structural heart disease. And these are my uh, key points uh, for uh, my portion of the talk. And that, you know, Peter described a lot about heart failure and the intersection with bowel disease, and they really do beget each other. And I'm going to show you some data from my perspective about this. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about structural heart disease therapy and how uh, it does improve symptoms, even for patients who are in the latest stages of heart failure therapy. 
And then finally, I want to uh, spend some time and talk a little bit about what we're doing here at MHI and also the foundation because I think we all should be really proud of our program. Uh, we really have been leading the way in many innovative trials. And uh, it's been a wonderful collaboration between the Structural Heart Group and Heart Failure among many of you who have been wonderful partners. And uh, we continue to need your help uh, in that regard. So when I think of heart failure, and, and Peter and I decided to put this together uh, a while back uh, this year because we were seeing a lot of patients with both conditions. And, you know, when I look at heart failure and I, and I think of heart failure, this is kind of what I think about. I think about this. I think about, everybody know what this is? Rome. So everybody knows the adage is that all roads lead to Rome. And, uh, and valvular heart disease is one of those entities that left untreated will lead to heart failure. And Rome, uh, like many great cities, has had its leaders. Some of them look like this. Uh, but here, uh, here at uh, MHI, uh, we have, <laughs> and uh, you know, much more friendly, much more engaging. Not a stone cold emperor by any means. And Peter has just been an amazing collaborator. As the entire section heart failure and the surgeons, and and you know, as many of you know, I, I, I interact with people from other centers, and they ask, you know, well, how do you, how do you do this? How do you how how is the bowel program as as successful as it is? Well, it's because we have this incredible collaboration here. Uh, our services are aligned. Our goals are aligned. They're aligned for the interest of the patient. And uh, again, I, I can't thank you enough. So, you know, if you think about that and think about, well, roads lead to heart failure, and that's the common way we think about structural heart disease is that left untreated will lead to heart failure. But this morning, we want to spend a little time and talk about, well, how does heart failure also impact structural heart disease because they really do interact with each other in terms of one side influencing the other. And as an example of that, I'll share with you this uh, slide about pathophysiology. So here we have a patient with aortic stenosis, and you can see the valve is calcified. And we often think of this as a one-way highway. You know, aortic stenosis causes pressure hypertrophy. And for us as interventionalists and surgeons, we think, well, we do an AVR, and for the most part, it's curative, provided that there are no major illnesses that drive the patient's morbidity. But it is a curative, and we know that it's not completely curative, because especially if they have myocardial disease, and the presence of any myocardial disease in a patient with aortic stenosis really is adverse. And the most common thing we look at is LV ejection fraction. And as an example of this, you can see this is a study that looked at LV ejection fraction uh, less than 30, uh, 30 to 50, and 50 or more. This, these were 11,000 patients who had TAVR and TVT. And, and not surprisingly, uh, if you have a lower EF, you have a higher cumulative mortality. I, I don't think that surprises anyone. But again, it just alerts us to the fact that we do have to look at things besides the valve. And we have a new uh, trial that will be looking at patients with reduced EF and even AS that's not severe. Because you can imagine that a failing heart may not be able to tolerate a narrow valve that may not be in the severe range. And as an example of that, this is a study uh, that looked at the four-year outcome uh, for patients who had moderate AS by the echo criteria. And look, look at the four-year death rate. Half of these patients were dead in the, or in the uh, hospital with heart failure. 36% of them uh, were completely dead. And so we actually have a trial starting in the next quarter. Uh, this is going to be the TAVR unload study. It's already underway at multiple centers in the United States, 600 patients. And it's going to test whether or not treating moderate disease in patients with LV dysfunction is of benefit. I think we're all excited uh, to be part of this because intuitively this makes sense, uh, but we will see. But, you know, it's, it's not just the ejection fraction. And, uh, and when we look at aortic stenosis and heart failure, again, any myocardial disease is going to be adverse. And, and these are figures that, that were provided graciously to me by Dual Cavalcante. As many of you know, it's been a wonderful addition to our practice. And if you look at this, this is from an MRI in here. These are the three things that we commonly focus on. We commonly look at the aortic valve, and that should be playing there. I'm sorry about that. 
we look, come and look at the LV function, and we come and look at uh, perfusion. And you can look at this uh, one way or the other. So the, the slides are not playing here. My idea is um, do you need the FSAT or not? So. But, um, but we come and look at these three things, whether you use echo, whether you use cath, clinically, however you want to look at it, and you can see them easily uh, with MRI. But it's more than just these three parameters. So you can also look at things like replacement fibrosis, interstitial fibrosis, degree of scarring, and you can look at other things, other causes of heart failure like amyloidosis. So again, we're going beyond a simple EF. EF, you have to look at but it's more than just yes. And so you're going to see more and more of our patients get MRI studies in addition to the echoes, the CTs, everything else that go along. And we're going to have to put all of this together because each one of these portions on this slide has been shown to be, has shown to be incrementally uh, prognostic. Let's see if the next one's playing. So, so that's AS. Let, let's now uh, switch gears and talk a little bit about MR. And I'm really glad Peter showed you those really fancy pressure curves and measure, me, mentioned Frank Starling because, uh, you know, we're, I'm here to talk a little bit about heart failure and it's a little bit about uh, being a fish out of water, but if you bear with me and just take yourself back to the basic science stage, wherever you went to school, and look at these two curves. And here we have on the left, this is a Frank Starling traditional curve, and here on the right is the traditional force tension relation. And Frank Starling, of course, is preload versus myocardial performance. Force tension is afterload versus myocardial performance. And, you know, when I show these because, you know, when we look at how correction of MR has affected patients, the classic dogma has been that correcting MR when you have heart failure can make the patient worse. And the reason why this has come about is because when you look at these curves, this is what tends to happen. Well, on the left-hand side, you have a decrease in the preload because you're taking away that regurgitant volume. So you're taking that, so you're going down on the curve. And on the right-hand side, there's this theoretical concern that if you cap off that mitral valve, you're not going to allow that pop-off into the left atrium. So there's this potential for increasing afterload. So in both curves, you're moving in the wrong direction. And so you hear this dogma, and I heard this over and over, even, if, you know, even as I was a cardiologist fellow, that the EF drops when you correct the MR, and the patients can do worse uh, after surgery. <coughs> so with that, I'm going to share with you some modern experiences with TMBR, and I'm going to try to get this to play at the same time. And these are two patients who have had correction of their MR, and they've come to see us in clinic. And you know, you, you, you you look at the echo ahead of time and you think, oh boy, EF is still 30, MR is gone, uh, but the EF is still 30. I'm not sure sure how they're going to be doing. Well, this is this is how they're going to be doing. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm doing good. I have no shortness of breath. I can sleep good, anything. Excellent. All right. 
So it, it's amazing to think that, wow, if you take care of their MR and survive the procedure, they can actually do quite well. And if you look at the study that's going to be coming out here in Jack, we actually looked at the first 109 patients. And it's been an amazing experience. There have been now 160 of these patients treated worldwide. No operative death uh, for TMDR in 160 patients treated thus far. The 30-day observed expected mortality, less than one, is 0.76. And for patients who survived the procedure, at one year, 87% of them were, had mild or no symptoms. So it's quite impressive. In the KCCQ, an average increase of 22 points. And for those of you who may not be familiar with KCCQ, the FDA considers a five-point increase as being significant. And so when you think about this, it's, it's quite amazing how we're challenging that dogma. And just as Peter, says, Peter said, you know, we look at all these things, we, we throw pills at these patients, and we look at the mitral valve, and we think that it's been the secondary bystander. But in fact, it's become actually a very important component uh, of, of the therapy for these patients. And it may not correct their EF, but if they can live without heart failure or have improvement in their symptoms, we really have one uh, for these patients. And so now we're in Summit, uh, which is the U.S. pivotal trial uh, for Tendine. And uh, we're also in Tendine and MAC, and I just showed this up there because uh, this has uh, also been an incredible experience as well. For patients who have severe MAC, uh, Ben and I have done all these cases together, and it, it's been fabulous. We enrolled our first patient last year, Vino Chirani, or the national uh, PI, and uh, uh, we look forward to participating in that, too. So here's another patient, and I'm, I hope the video plays here, but this is a 79-year-old man who's on guideline-directing medical therapy. He's had everything thrown at him, the kitchen sink, CRT, ICD, everything. And we decide to bring him to the lab because he's got this severe MR here. And these are images taken by Richard. And you can see on the bottom, uh, we actually put a clip in, and the MR goes from torrential uh, to only mild. And if you look at a patient like this, uh, this is what happens to his LA pressure right there in front of us. And it's incredibly gratifying. Look at that B weight. That's all that regurgitant volume that's going into the left atrium. And within a half hour, his LA pressure is now normal, and he goes home the next day. And so you might ask, well, why are we doing procedures like this? Well, this is related to the COAP trial. And so the COAP trial, I'm sure many of you have heard about this trial. It was made a big splash uh, this past September at TCT. And this is a very rigorous study in which patients were randomized uh, for mitral versus guideline direct medical therapy. It had to be maximal and stable in an ambulatory patient with a reduced DF. And the amazing thing about this trial is that if you look at heart failure hospitalization, correction of the MR, you only needed to treat three to save a hospitalization. And to save a life, you only needed to treat six. And so if you think about that, that number needed to treat is one of the lowest uh, uh, number needed to treat to save a life in the history of cardiovascular medicine. It's actually even less than beta blockers, ACE, and ARBs for heart failure. It's right there with surgical ADR for aortic stenosis. It's actually really shocking. It just blew everybody out of the water. And if anybody who tells you that they predicted this is a liar. There was no one who predicted this. No one. And, and you might ask, well, why is this happening? Well, this is an example of how MR and heart failure really do beget each other. So if you look, in blue are the patients who had mitral clip. And you can see this is LV volume. Look what happens. Oh, sorry, that's medical therapy. Look what happened to the patients who had medical therapy in terms of LV volume. It went that way. And if you look at the patients who had mitral clip, it went that way. And so it actually was a complete divergence in the past for how these patients did in terms of their heart failure and their outcome. And if you're interested in learning more about this, Tomorrow night, uh, we're going to be getting into this uh, article in much more detail. It's one of the two articles uh, that we'll be doing as part of Journal Club uh, tomorrow night. If you haven't already CP'd, uh, just call Mario. Uh, he'll be able to take your number. <laughs> so, all right. And so um, I just want to finish with a couple more uh, uh, stories here. And this is a 35-year-old woman. She had class 3 symptoms. And you look on the left here, 
for LV it's eight centimeters, and on the right it's six and a half. And for various reasons we don't need to get into, she was not an LVAD candidate. And you might ask, well, what did we do here? Uh, and in this case, we actually did not treat the valve. We actually directly treated the myocardium. And this is what we did. This is called AccuSense. And this is a, um, a percutaneous ventricular therapy. And this is a, a therapy in which we go retroaortic up the aorta, cross the aortic valve, and place a series of anchors along the subendocardium underneath the mitral valve apparatus. And then we pull it all together. And so you can see here, this is uh, Mario and I have uh, did this case together. You can see the anchors uh, line here in the subendocardial cardio space. We then pull in the anchors and cinch it up. And that pulls up the LV. And we're passing a model, a 3D printed model of a before and after. And you can see the acute LV remodeling. And it's been incredibly gratifying to see how she's done. This is her. her, her she's publicly out there. Her name is uh, Stephanie Rawson. You know, there's a discussion about her eight centimeter heart and how she's better. And here's a quote, uh, thank you for saving my life. And, and she's, she's done uh, quite well. So we have a number of studies that Peter and I are doing together. Uh, the AccuSense trials at MHIF at the top are, uh, is the main study. And it's enrolling patients with moderate or severe uh, MR. Uh, and then we're also looking at patients who have just dilated LV. Uh, no need for valvular disease, just a dilated LV. And then also patients in whom uh, either surgery or mitral clip uh, did not work for MR and there's a recurrence. And so multiple different trials targeting directly that myocardium, not just the valve, uh, but again, uh, the root cause. As Peter mentioned, he went over uh, at TR, uh, and TR has been a very difficult uh, uh, pathophysiology, and as many of you know, I, I showed this slide uh, earlier this February in which we took a patient with uh, torrential TR. Uh, for those of you who are interested, that's not the LV. That's actually the RV. Uh, it's actually uh, ginormous. And uh, we, Richard and I, you can see, we put in a couple of clips there and uh, got a nice result. And when I look at TR, this is kind of how I think about it. And, and I think there's going to be a lot more insight into how we look at TR because we really still don't know what we're doing. And, uh, and, but here's one way that you might think of TR currently. And so if you look at this, so here's survival and symptoms on the left and then years. And if you look at these different grades, moderate, severe, massive, torrential, we know, as Peter showed you earlier, that when patients have moderate TR, they're already impaired. And that can be for a variety of reasons, but probably we're underestimating severity. And the reason why is because we're using left-sided criteria for the right side. And that makes very little sense because the left-sided loading conditions are different from the right side. You're not going to get the color splash that you get with severe TR. So we're probably undercoding. For severe TR, it can be an incredibly indolent disease. And you might ask, well, why is that? Well, Peter described the medical therapy before that. And the reason why, I think, is because severe PR is actually relatively easy to manage with diuretics. For those of you who take care of congenital patients, you know you don't have to have a trifecta valve. You can actually do a lot with diuretics and medical therapy. But for those patients who have significant PR that's impacting them, they're often on diuretics for left-sided disease. You know, if you think about that, you're treating other heart failure with diuretics, and that can mask the underlying RV dysfunction that's happening to the, from the TR as the patients are going along. I think that RV failure is a late phenomenon. It is, it's a judge duty, just as Peter showed you. It, it, it's really, really late. When RV failure happens, it's, the RV is far gone. It's dilated, and, uh, and it's, it's, it's a very bad, ominous sign. And then after that, once you see uh, that happen and you get massive and torrential TR, it's an extremely steep drop-off. But importantly, it's actually steep both ways. It's steep going down, and it's also steep coming up. And you might ask, well, why do you say that? Why do you say it's steep coming up, too? Well, these are data that are actually I'm showing publicly for the first time. Uh, these are data from the Triluminate study, which looked at, is looking at triclip for TR, the mitral clip devices for TR. 
first 60 patients. And here along the bottom is severe, massive, and torrential at start. And this is KCCQ at 30 days. And you can see all of these patients had improvement in their KCCQ by about 15 points on average. But what I'm not sharing with you here is that this is achieved by just one grade reduction in each category. In other words, the torrentials went to massive, the massives went to severe, the severes went to moderate. So half the patients still had severe TR, but there was still considerable meaningful improvement. And so it's steep both ways. And I think for those of you who see these TR patients, you don't have to do a whole lot. <coughs> TR can be somewhat forgiving, and you can actually improve renal perfusion, you can improve the quality of life, even with modest improvements uh, in the TR. And we have two studies here. We have Tricinch, which is the Fortec device. I don't have time to show it to you this morning, but we also have uh, the Triclip. So two TR studies here. David Adams and I are the national investigators. This will be a 40-center study, uh, probably about 600 patients across the United States, and we're launching here in the next quarter. And then finally, I want to uh, end with this. And uh, for those of you who don't know this already, Peter, Mike, and I, among others, will do these for you. If you have a patient with unexplained dyspnea, uh, effort tolerance, and, and you're struggling uh, with why these patients are con continuing to call me with complaints, we'll bring them to the lab and do exercise studies. And the way we do this is we do a, use a supine bike. We use a VO2 uh, to measure uh, directly the cardiac output and accurately. And we'll have a swan or a wedge catheter to measure the right-sided pressures. We'll often also even throw an echo to look at exercise-induced valve disease to get the complete picture. And for some patients, we'll see something like this. This is one of our patients, normal at rest. Wedge was 12. And with 20 watts of exercise, her wedge was 39. So not surprisingly, she, she passed through. And as Peter mentioned, there are many different things you can do for HEFPEF. From the interventional side, there is some excitement about atrial shunting uh, for heart failure. There are two devices out there. There's the Corvia, uh, which is this 8-millimeter device, and there's the B-Wave, which is a 5-millimeter valve. And both of these uh, have been shown to decrease exercise-induced pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. And if you're interested on a editorial about the state of the art, Peter, Mike, and I actually wrote uh, one that just came out uh, last week uh, on the V-Wave, which is in Jack Intervention. But we also have a new device, and this is something, again, publicly being shown for the first time. This is the uh, root device, and it's made by Edwards. And one of the criticisms for these devices has been that it's an atrial shunt, so you're creating a hole. Well, Mike, Rooney, and I and Emil here and Mario, we actually spend a lot of time closing these holes, right? So why do you want to open one? Uh, because, because there can be this risk of paradoxical embolism. Well, Edwards has actually come up with this ingenious way of actually going through the coronary sinus and creating the hole there. And by creating the hole there, you actually take advantage of the anti-grade flow down the coronary sinus to prevent paradoxical emboli. And this is how it's done. You can see there's a balloon catheter in the coronary sinus. We actually pierce into the left atrium. And I'm just going to fast forward it here. And we eventually dilate this area and then put in a shunt here. And this is what it looks like. You can see there it's got a couple of feet uh, on the left atrial side and a couple of feet on the coronary sinus side. And then you remove the catheter. And the nice thing is that these are some data from the animal studies, and you can see that it's a nitinol frame, like most stents, it gets endothelialized within a couple of months, and then it remains uh, patent thereafter. And so uh, Linnell, who's in the audience here, and I, we had the pleasure of doing the first case here just one month ago. Uh, she was that patient who had a wedge pressure of 39 with exercise. And here it is. So on the top right, this is the catheter coming from the right IJ the 14 French catheter. We go into the coronary sinus. We uh, put a wire in. We blow up a balloon to stabilize things. We pierce into the left atrium. And then we leave behind uh, this uh, stent here. And these are beautiful pictures taken by Richard Bay. And you can see here this, uh, this shunt here on uh, the 3D image. And then patency here uh, uh, with the colorful imaging. 
And so this is a, a brand new device. Uh, we're really excited to be part of this. I am the PI for this nationally. Right now we have four centers. We're all going to have six here in a couple of months. Ambulatory heart failure or, uh, with either preserved extraction or reduced. They have to have elevated wedge at rest or with exercise and on stable medical therapy. And obviously, no significant bowel disease are the things that could be causing the hep test. And uh, we're actually going to be enrolling uh, right now. So uh, uh, again, uh, it's been a pleasure uh, to be a part of this. My three key points, think of heart failure and how the two entities beget each other. Think of structural heart disease. I do think we can do a lot for these patients, even in the latest stages uh, of heart failure. And again, I, I can't be more proud to be part of this program with Peter and all of you. It's been just amazing to be leading these trials. And we're really grateful for all your help. And uh, we still need your help. So, so thank you very much. And before we finish, I just want to, uh, I can't see who's out there, but this, all of the heart failure research coordinators and the valve research coordinators can just stand up for us. So uh, Sarah, I know Sarah's here. <laughs> and I just wanted to really acknowledge all of them uh, because enrolling in these patients, it's a labor of love. And, uh, and we actually started meeting regularly and, uh, and to, to talk about strategies for enrollment. And I wanted you to see their faces so you can call them and not me. So uh, thank you all. <laughs> We do have a, some time for questions, if anyone's got any questions. Uh, great talk, obviously. And, and the, the question that I have, we see now patients floating in, and, and they are not on you know, therapy that was started by uh, Peter and his group. So they are sometimes on no therapy if we have calls about uh, eligibility for trials, you see that even referring institutions that academics are not putting patients on optimum medical therapy. So how do we, you know, get this out of in the community? Well, that's a, a great question. I think we spend a lot of time thinking about how to optimize medical therapy in general and how to be sure on a population basis that we're doing that. Um, so I think that's something that, you know, that we've been working with HDI on and, and hope to hear more about that in the future. On an individual patient basis, you know, one thing that, that I know we've talked a little a little bit about is that I think we, at least as the heart failure group, are, are happy to see these patients and, and you know, sort of co-manage them and co-evaluate them with you, um, much like we do with the surgeons when we're looking at patients for LVADs. And so we're eager to be involved in whatever way um, is helpful. And I think it also helps sensitize us to the treatment options that are available, um, knowing sort of what's involved and who's eligible for these trials. So. Um, feel free to use us in that regard, but on a bigger population basis, that's sort of a holy grail of heart failure care is how do we make sure everyone's getting not just to be on an ACE inhibitor, but that they're not just on two and a half of lisinopril and that's declared adequate. I mean, for me, everything starts with medical therapy. And, uh, and so if they're not on awful medical therapy, I just refer them straight to the section of heart failure. And what we really haven't talked a lot about is also the role of these devices in the context of LVAD and transplant. And I, and I think that's actually a much more difficult situation. As an example, the 35-year-old woman that I showed you earlier, there was a lot of discussion that we had, well, we should really insist on an LVAD in her or insist on a transplant. And those types of collaborations are going to become really, really important. So I think of us as sharing more and more patients and not being isolated silos like we historically have been. Terrific talk. And, and you know, just a segue on that, Paul, um, you know, one problem that we saw um, also is in patients that have functional advanced MR, when you put the VET, not all of them, after you do the VET, they resolve their MR. And there is some emerging data that, you know, big, you know, prolongation or continuation of that MR is also bad. But uh, would like to hear your thoughts about, you know, the, and you know, maybe it doesn't occur here in MHI, but, you know, after device implantation, a lot of these heart failure patients have ICDs and CRTs and whatnot. Tricuspid regurgitation related to pacing leads, you know, how does that change your approach and would that change and how would you tackle that? So um, you can do um, transcath therapy with the pacing or, uh, or defibrillator leads in place, uh, but the challenge is that those leads are often interacting with the bowel. 
and uh, and if there's tethering open to stuff that we could, we, we just say no. Uh, and the only way we say yes is if they go and have a lead extraction and the anatomy is still suitable. That discussion becomes very, very difficult for these patients because it's a two-step process down a road that may not yield anything. You know, if you think about, and if you hear, hear Chuck see what he says about lead extraction risk, you're asking the patient to take on the risk of extraction without clear benefit that the anatomy will be suitable for clipping or tricension, whatever device you will do. And that discussion usually takes an hour or two, uh, and it's because it's so complex. Um, but you know, it, 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 those are very hard. They're new, so there are some newer devices. You know, the tricench, they do say that you can do it despite the lead. But if there's any evidence that it's impinging the lead, or uh, impinging the lead, let me say no. Chuck, do you want to comment on risk of lead extraction and how we, we we've done a few of those and then done triplets? Yeah. So, so we we do extract leads if we feel that 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 would be beneficial to utilize one of these devices. Unfortunately, you know the the risk of a major complication is in the one percent range, um, and if you take the lead out after it's been in for a while, unless it's acute. Um, you, if anything, the, the TR will be worse or the same. It won't get better because if you're actually actively extracting the lead and it's on the tricuspid septal leaflet, you may actually tear the leaflet in some cordy as you're actually removing it. So you may actually make things worse. I, I'm actually very glad that, that you brought that up. But the second part of that is also you know, there's a lot about electrical therapy that makes the heart better, and that also reduces MR. And one of the things I would caution you on is there was a procedure we were doing a while back through the coronary sinus to try to cinch up the mitral valve. And actually, some of those coronary sinuses were occluded. And once they're occluded, you can't put a lead, a CRT lead in. So I think the electrophysiologist section always has been very progressive in terms of wanting to discuss and help and do things in an order that makes the best sense for the patient, whether that be lead extraction, putting in a CRT lead, trying his bundle pacing or something like that, that uh, may actually uh, mitigate factors, uh, not necessarily mean that you won't go on to the other advanced therapies, uh, but you know, trying to do it in a stepwise fashion so that you actually can get the maximum benefit from all the different therapies that we have. Say Paul, Peter, excellent, amazing work. The one of the things I struggle with is these really low EF patients. They're on optimal medical therapy, and uh, what uh, processes do you have in your mind to discern which way to go? You know, LVAD versus mitroclid, that sort of stuff. This is this is a great question. It's something I think we struggle with a lot. I rely pretty heavily on the hemodynamics. I think you know, the clinical course and the size of the LV are factors. Um, what's the person's, you know, overall medical status? What's their renal function? What's their psychosocial support? I think if the question comes up uh, of, you know, whether there's a role for mechanical circulatory support here or not, um, then that becomes a matter of plugging them into the VAD evaluation process where, you know, we spend a lot of time thinking about this and are fortunate to have um, surgeons who straddle both worlds who do conventional surgery for valve disease and who also put in ventricular assist devices. And so I think the collective judgment here is important. It's rare that, that there's any one person who sort of has the truth uh, of what is best to do for any individual patient. And we sometimes struggle with do we uh, pursue more of a transcatheter valve approach because someone is a very poor candidate for mechanical support? Um, even if the mechanical support might be um, mechanistically a, a more comprehensive solution. And I, I think the woman that Paul presented is someone who um, we could have made the argument that that would have been a better treatment for her um, if you looked just at the valve disease and the amount of LV dilation and so forth. But when you took her whole medical and psychosocial history and everything into account, it was clear that that wasn't an option for her. So sometimes we have the decisions sort of forced upon us, um, but that's something that it, it really is a good example of why this is such a team sport between imaging and, and EP and interventional. And you know, to Chuck's point, um, 
I had meant to include a slide on the role of CRT in reducing MR, for example, and just you know only had so many chunks of slides. Um, but I couldn't agree more that, that electrical therapy often is, is important for that, especially for the low EF patients. So it, it, it just be, behooves us to continue to work together and collaborate and, and you know make the decisions with hopefully the patient at the center of the discussion. So it, it's great to be a part of such a uh, engaged team. Chuck? I just have one, one observation, one, thing, one way of thinking about it. You know, if you take somebody in significant heart failure and you put them on a big dose of beta blockers, they deteriorate. But if you put them on a little bit of beta blocker and you persist and you eventually titrate it up to actually do better in, in, in all facets. I suspect it's very similar in, in mitral and tricuspid valve disease. If you go there and you close the door acutely, and the surgeons can tell you about that, so if you take somebody with a 30% EF to surgery and you suddenly close the, the mitral valve so that it no longer leaks, it uh, you know it can be catastrophic. And from that French study, you indicated patients stayed in the ICU for a long time because it, it's a bad deal. On the other hand, you know maybe some of the thinking that we is, is there a way we could gradually fix it? And well, I think that's a that's a challenge. Some of the data Paul showed, I think, supports that. Of even, you know, the triclip data, mm -hmm. where you make the make the valve disease better, they feel better. Now, it's obviously hard to titrate that. Yeah. Of you know, return Q three months for another clip. But yeah, um, I'd be curious for your thoughts. Yeah, I, I absolutely. So, like some of the TMBR patients, they have struggled in the unit for a few days, but then they get to be like the patients that I showed you. And how we need to identify those. I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done, whether it's a dobutamine echo, looking at strain, looking at MRI, or what have you. We really don't really have a way of differentiating who's going to bounce back immediately when that door is closed versus those who are going to struggle a little bit. A lot of times, the patients do require some pressure support for a day or so in the ICU. That's very, very common, and I suspect it is because of that closing the door. It's interesting because with the uh, mitral clip, though, it almost never happens. They almost always go home the next day. That LA pressure drop, we close that door completely. That LA pressure came completely down, and it's better. And I think because one thing I didn't comment on is that I showed you that forced tension relation between afterload and stroke volume. The afterload is not just because of closing off that mitral valve. The afterload is a function of wall tension, which is a function of pressure times radius. And if you're taking a heart that's enlarged and making it smaller, you're actually reducing the afterload. And so if you're taking away the preload pre and making the afterload better, that's how we make the patients better. So I think it's still a lot to learn, but we, are, in essence, are not as good about predicting who is going to bounce back, like you said. 